Welcome to St. Joseph Radio Presents. This is the pre-introduction to the radio program. So hello, everybody out there in internet land. We are going to be with Monsignor Eugene Morris, who is not only brilliant, but a wonderfully holy man. I can't tell you how happy I am that we get to talk to him. We're going to be talking about the Mass, mostly. And in some respects, the traditional Mass, sometimes called the Extraordinary Form, and a little bit about the new one. But look, Monsignor has a licentiate in, I think that's how you say it, in sacramental theology. You, like me, will be able to listen to him forever. So tune in and uh, tell a friend about this. Welcome to the St. Joseph Radio Presents live program broadcasting to you from the Rome of the West, St. Louis, Missouri. The program that for over 30 years has brought you eloquent speakers from across the globe to help explain, clarify, and evangelize the Catholic faith. Our program covers a variety of topics relating to current issues and occurrences in our daily lives. Now, with the aid of technology, we are able to bring the gospel message to the four corners of the world, where Christ himself did say, those who have ears ought to hear. It is our hope at St. Joseph Radio that through these programs, we can help evangelize the world and change one soul at a time. Now, here is your host to introduce today's guest and topic. Well, thank you, Matt. Uh, I am your host today, Peter Karutz, and this is St. Joseph Radio Presents, coming to you live from St. Louis, Missouri, the Rome of the West. Uh, I have the great honor and privilege of being with Monsignor Morris today. He is um, my, what I would like to say, my younger brother. At least he's a year younger than my younger brother, so he's a very, very, very young man. And not not only a very young man, but a very brilliant man. Uh, I was listening to one of the videos that Monsignor did, and I think he said something. He actually said, I think I could talk about sacramental theology for uh, forever. Well, you know what? I could probably listen to him forever. Not only is Monsignor brilliant, he's such a really holy man. So, Monsignor, thank you so much for being here. Peter, it's good to be here with you. How are you? Happy New Year to you, my friend. Happy New Year to you. Thank you very much. And blessed Christmas still, because the Christmas season does not end until... At least in the old calendar until this coming Wednesday. See now, so we now still have I, a few, I'm learning. We again. have a few more days left to celebrate the mystery of our Lord's incarnation. So all that good stuff. Blessings to you, well, Monsignor. Tell me about. I always thought it was Epiphany. Um, well, so there's there are a number of different ways of approaching it. So of course, and I know we're going to dive in a little bit uh, deeply in our show today into the traditional Mass, and so there are different calendars. Uh, between the traditional calendar and the current calendar for the Novus Ordo. But even then, there are some who will talk about the octave of Christmas as kind of the immediate celebration of Christmas. And then in the new calendar, the Christmas season goes actually to the baptism of the Lord. Uh So usually it's, depending on how the calendar falls, uh, the baptism of the Lord usually is also the first Sunday of what we call in the Novus Ordo ordinary time or ordered time. Yeah. And then in the old calendar, it went to Epiphany, and in, I mean, pardon me, to uh, Candlemas, or the Purification of Our Lady. And it's an interesting thing, because I, I was doing some preparation for our Mass on Wednesday, because Candlemas is the typical day uh, in, in both calendars where you'll bless candles for liturgical use and for home use. The preface that we are asked to use is the preface for Christmas. And it does harken back to this period of 40 days that we've had to contemplate the mystery of the Incarnation. So all three of those kind of lines of demarcation, the Christmas octave itself, the baptism of the Lord, and then candle mass can be part of your kind of living in, if you will, the liturgical year. As, I sure, as I'm sure you have figured out, we are about to learn something. So we're going to be talking a little bit about the traditional mass or... I think, as Pope Benedict coined it, the extraordinary form. And I think it is extraordinary. It isn't unusual. It's extraordinary. So, uh, and, and just realizing that we're not just talking about a difference in the Mass as it's uh, presented, nothing different in the substance of the Mass, Correct. but just in the way it's presented, but also in the various traditions. You mentioned it, the calendar. So, Monsignor, I, uh, you are a very holy man, and I'm oh, yeah. honored to be here. 
uh, and I'm honored to keep my job. And I am supposed to, we're supposed to start with a prayer. And Let's do I am that. already a couple of minutes into it. Would That's you all help right. us out here? By all means. Thank you. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Gracious Father, draw near to us now and bless us with the time you've provided us, that as we grow in the knowledge of our faith, we so too may grow in the courage to preach and live and teach our faith in the world. Bless all those who are listening, all those who will benefit from all that is said and learned today. Let truly everything that we say give you fitting glory and praise and strengthen us to do your will in our daily lives. We make this prayer and all our prayers through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you, Monsignor. I I just want to get a few things out uh, on the table beforehand. First off... The traditional mass or the extraordinary form. Let's is... stick actually. Let's oh, actually okay. clarify some Please. nomenclature. Um, so the the uh, while all due deference to Benedict the Sixteenth in calling the extraordinary form what it was, and then the ordinary form, it really kind of created uh, a, a kind of a misconception. In some ways, it's like ordinary time. So for English speakers, when you think of the word ordinary, you think of something that's kind of daily, quotidian, not very interesting. It's kind of as ordinary as kind of blah. The word ordinary actually should be better translated from the Latin into the English as ordered or ordinal time, because these Sundays in what is ordinary time are the Sundays after the celebration of Pentecost until we get to the first Sunday of Advent, and those Sundays by tradition have been ordered. So to call the extraordinary form extraordinary gives the, or gave the impression, I mean, even still gives the impression that it is something uh, beyond, if you will, our normal experience as Catholics, when in truth, it is another expression of the celebration of the sacred mysteries. Now, that's become a little bit muddled in light of the newest motto proprio, and I think we're going to jump into that a little bit too. Got a lot to talk about today, so we can parse it out, but let's stick with the traditional Mass. Yeah, and, and the only thing I was going to say is I, I took the time to read carefully mm-hmm. both Pope Benedict's and Pope Francis's. Yes. And um, I, I'll encourage everybody to read it. Um, I think they have different tones, but um, uh, and I, I think that the, in, in, in candor that Pope Benedict's um, was very heartfelt and broad and open, um, but uh, uh the the opposite is not necessarily true. In other words, we're not doing something we're not supposed to be doing Correct. by uh, having the. Shall I call it the traditional form? Yeah, the traditional form. But we're not doing anything wrong. You you have proper uh, um, uh, permission from the bishop, so we're not doing anything wrong. So no no confusion there. I got to tell you this, and in, in all deference to what you said, Monsignor, uh, I am old enough to remember the uh, traditional form of the mass, but I don't. <laughs> I just don't remember it. I was too young. But my friends and I, my um, uh, men's group, mm-hmm. uh, years ago, we started on first Saturday going to St. Anselm's for the traditional mass. Right, from, yeah, which would have been the original home of my oratory. Exactly right. Yes. And it, it was different. It was, it was the opposite of what I was expecting. Remember, I don't remember it as a child. Right. It, it, the, the level of reverence, uh, it, it wasn't impersonal, which is what I thought it would be. It was extraordinarily personal. I mean, the priest, instead of uh, looking at us, was praying with us in the same direction. I, I, I will say this, it is a different form of, uh, of worshiping in the Mass, and, and I'll say a very deep way of doing so, a, a, as somebody who experienced it for the first time as an adult. I wouldn't disagree with with any of that. You you said you're a year older than I am. No, you're a year younger than my younger Youngest brother. brother. Okay. So I'm so, sixty, and you're okay. about fifty four. I'm fifty. I'll be fifty seven this coming June. Ooh. Okay. So if you're sixty, you were born in nineteen sixty one. So you actually probably have no living memory at I don't. all, because by the time you would have been of first communion age, let's mm-hmm. say, at the age of reason at the age of seven would have been in 1967, 68. The current dispensation, the Novus Ordo, was already in place. Mm -hmm. So our generation actually doesn't, we don't actually even have a lived experience of it. I mean, if you went, uh, you may have even gone during that period of transition. So so I would agree with you. In, In going, it certainly is, for all of us who have grown, which is the majority now of the Church in some ways, has grown up with and lived under the reforms of the Second Vatican Council. 
and that is a particular way of worshiping. The traditional Mass is another way of worshiping. One of the things that I have tried to help people understand, because although there, there, there has never been this um, kind of two forms, if you will, of the one Roman rite, what actually... I try to help people conceptualize it in understanding the different the different rites that do exist under the Latin Church. So you have the Maronites, you have the Ruthenians, uh, the Dominicans have their own rite in, by history. There was a, a rite called the Psalm Rite or Salisbury or English. The Ambrosian Rite still exists in uh, Milan after St. Ambrose. There's some 23 of them plus an ordinary, ordinary In the right? Anglican order, exactly. So there, there are, so to say that there are different ways of worshiping and therefore different ways of experience it is not to say that any of those are in conflict with each other or to say that one needs to kind of push the other one out of the way and uh, again the we'll, we'll probably we'll do some history as to how we have arrived at where we are now but I think that is a legitimate point to say that what people perceive about the Latin mass so again the the, the, the two biggest complaints are it's in Latin I don't know Latin Okay, that's all right. Ninety-five percent of people don't know Latin, didn't know it before, and uh, the priest has got his back to me. Well, he doesn't have his back to you. And the image I always use there is: look, if my bus driver is driving my bus, I don't want him looking at me. I want him <laughs> facing in the same direction I'm facing and driving. Even more so, the one who is ordained and in the person of Christ to lead us in prayer needs to be facing. The living God Himself. Right. So I tell people I was actually with uh, uh, some uh, a couple that's that's thinking of coming into the church through the oratory, and again, it's a, and I get it. It was a struggle for me. I've been celebrating now fairly regularly the uh, traditional mass since March of 2014 mm-hmm. was my first public celebration, and um, obviously I've been rector. I shouldn't say obviously I've been rector of the oratory of Saints Gregory and Augustine since 2018, where that has now become, I would say, I don't celebrate the uh, New Mass that frequently. I still do, but not that frequently. I get that it's hard, but I think if you can open up your mind, like in anything, if you go to the the uh, the, the uh, Mass of St. John Chrysostom, uh, if you go to St. Raymond's here in the Archdiocese and you go to Maronite, you're going to have a different language. You go to a Byzantine church, you're going to have a different language, a, a different structure, maybe different vesture, uh, things that are going to be foreign to us because that's not the way we worship. But if you were to go regularly over time, you would eventually come to appreciate those and know those as well as you know the current way you celebrate. And and not to diminish our participation in the Mass, because it is, I mean, as, as we say, it's your sacrifice and... Our, you, sac- right, our right. your sacrifice and mine, uh, but uh, I heard Father Bede uh, one time when he was celebrating the uh, traditional mass was trying to put it into some perspective. He said, "If you were at a great speech in France with hundreds of thousands of people, and uh, you know Charles de Gaulle was up there, mm-hmm. and, you know, and and everyone was was appreciating what was going on," he says, "Because you didn't appreciate the words." didn't diminish the impact of what was being said. Correct. Similarly, because we didn't don't understand every word, doesn't diminish the reality of what's going on at Mass. And we, perhaps, should call ourselves to more, right? Call ourselves to more. In, in, in lo- learning a little bit of Latin and a little more and more Latin, we are really broadening ourselves. Look, lawyers use Latin all the time. Mm-hmm. We use Latin phrases all the time because it's it's meaningful in the words and the phrase beyond the few syllables that are expressed. So because we don't understand the words in their totality doesn't change the sacrifice of the Mass. I would agree wholeheartedly. It is, again, it's a, one of the beautiful things for me, and I, I, I keep a running tally uh, my people will laugh at me because I'll say it's reason number you know nine thousand nine hundred ninety nine that I love <laughs> being the rector and I love celebrating the traditional mass. There's always something, but one of the things that has happened to me personally as a priest is having to prepare. I mean, so I need I need I'm required to to speak as best I can the language in which I'm celebrating the sacraments. Uh, it has forced me to prepare myself to engage the readings. And, and it's interesting, it seems counterintuitive, but now having the readings in the vernacular and therefore being able to he- hear them, I don't think people do as much preparation at home as they probably should be doing, that remote preparation, which actually the Second Vatican Council called for. 
that we would do some. So we put all this in the language that would be accessible, so that when you are at home, you can begin preparing. So when you come to mass on Sunday, actually, since you wouldn't have to have a missal, you would hear. But your hearing wouldn't be the first time. So it wouldn't be me having to kind of, if you will. Uh, conceptualize what the words mean. Having done that, I can actually allow them to impact me spiritually. My wife uh, is a Spanish teacher uh, at uh, this college level, Mm -hmm. and uh, periodically when we go on driving trips, she will read in Spanish, and I will translate, and I'm terrible, and uh, when we switch driving, then I will read miserably in Spanish, and she would translate. But listening to something in, a, in, a, in, a, in your not native tongue, if you will, really makes you think about it. My, my men's group, uh, we read the scripture for the following Sunday on the Saturday. And the thing that changed for me after doing this for 12 or 13 years is that when I go to Mass, I don't open the Missal. Mm-hmm. I listen. Mm-hmm. There's a difference between reading and having the, having the scripture proclaimed. Mm-hmm. And I would imagine hearing it in a foreign language, uh, again, I'm not a- absolutely fluent in Spanish, but I hear words differently. Yes. And I hear them more profoundly. F- Father, I, 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 again, when I'm really, I, I say the rosary every day. Yes. But when I say the rosary in Spanish, I think about it a lot more profoundly. I think the scripture might be similar. When I pray the rosary in Latin, which I do, uh, I've prayed it in Italian, and actually I've prayed it in Spanish, because uh, I've been t- to Mexico. I've been to—we need to take a break, don't we? Yeah, this is—I <laughs> <laughs> am figured, getting out of I'm getting, uh, I, I totally figured, out of hand. I figure we're, just, we're, we're having such a good time talking. I'm like, we probably should take a break maybe, eh? This, this is St. Joseph Radio Presents, coming to you live from St. Louis, Missouri. I'm your host, Peter Karutz, and we're here with— Monsignor Eugene Morris, and we're talking about the traditional mass. And and thank you. Obviously, it is. If you haven't gathered from now uh, by now, it is exciting. It is not unusual. It is really extraordinary. So I, I'm so happy that we're we're talking about this. Uh, but you told me you you mentioned that the first time you um, celebrated the. Traditional mass yes. in public was in, in the in 2014. Yes. Not a long time ago. Not at all. So, so, so I mean, how how in the world did you happen to find yourself in? Because it takes some study and preparation. It does. So uh, so my uh, this isn't my first time on St. Joseph's Radio. But to remind our listeners, I am by training a sacramental theologian. So uh, I went to Rome to get a degree, sacramental theology. Came back, taught for almost ten years at the seminary here in St. Louis, Kenrick Glennon Seminary and then was invited to teach at the Pontifical College Josephinum in Columbus, Ohio. What happened in between that? Toward the Before I went to Columbus, the motu proprio of Benedict XVI, which was some more pontificum, came out uh, allowing for a, a more expansive utilization experience of the traditional Mass. And, and more. And more, right. And the sacraments as well. Yes, yes, the Mass itself, but then all the sacraments as well in, the, in their older forms. Uh, the then Archbishop of St. Louis, Cardinal Burke, was under the impression um, that I knew how to do this. And so he was sending <laughs> seminarians to me for any questions. I had to confess I was ignorant of how to do that as a priest. Now, I knew the old Mass, if we can phrase it that way, because having been teaching the new Mass, I needed to know where we—I mean, again, if you're going to do a good history, you need to know your lawyer. You know what that is. You, you got to know the background. You can't just— you can't just kind of get out there. You, so I'm, I, I knew the old Mass from studying it. So fast forward, I go to the Josephinum. The rector there says, look, I want you to learn this, because at that point we were celebrating both, and we needed a number of other priests to do that. said, okay, so interestingly enough, and again, this is the beauty of it, I felt in some ways like St. Ignatius of Loyola, mm-hmm. because here I am, a, 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 you know, a relatively seasoned priest at this point, 15 years almost of priesthood, and it's my students who knew the Mass who were teaching me. Young folks. My students who knew it through being servers themselves at the Old Mass were actually teaching me. Uh, it's very humbling, and that's one of the great graces for me. Again, that's reason 9,998. I don't know. Uh, I love the humility that it has forced me into, which has been a great spiritual grace. So I practiced for a year. I studied, I read, I labored, um, I looked at 
uh, books for pronunciation. I looked at books for structure. I did some spiritual reading, and then I would have a practice every week. And then eventually, in the Lenten season of 2014, I think it was the second or third week of March, uh, at an early morning, what we would call low mass, because there's low and high mass, uh, my, 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 my trainer, my server, who's also my teacher, who's now a priest in the Diocese of Nashville, said, let's just do this. He's a Monsignor. He's from uh, North Carolina originally. Monsignor, let's just go ahead and do this. <laughs> so at 6.30 in the morning, we did. And I will say... Uh, looking back on that and looking where I am now, and it was, a whole, I mean, from a kind of structural, if you will, what, what the what priest would refer to as kind of as an Arsh Celebrande, the manner in celebrating, this was a hot mess. I mean, there was nothing fluid or beautiful, <laughs> or it was, I was halting here in the language, and I didn't always remember where I was supposed to go, and he's whispering in my ear what to do. But when all was said and done, I, I, I wept at the end of it. It was so oh, I beautiful. Bet. I wept. Yeah. Yeah, I, I don't. I don't doubt it at all. And uh, you know, today we have something called the germ. Yes, and, I, and it tells us what we do and don't do. Yes, during, I, I imagine that there's got to be something similar to we that. Have, yes, we do have the same thing for for the tradition. As I go to the pr- traditional mass, it's very precise, as you say. It it, it isn't some free flowing, um, contemporaneous talk that happened to be in a church with a cross in it. I mean, it is extraordinarily precise. Every, everything from the additional uh, uh, vestiture that's mm, the the, on the right hand yes. and the, the movement and the number of blessings, it, it's extraordinarily, um, I think you, you said it in a, in a, in a talk about uh, the Mass, it, it, it's extraordinarily deliberate. Yes, it is. Yeah. And that forces you to be extraordinarily deliberate. It's again. It's a so here's a, here's again a beautiful a manifestation where what we're doing liturgically actually has great import in what we're doing spiritually. We are we you know, obedience is something that one receives by ver, by way of virtue, but something also one can be trained in to be obedient. And the more obedient I am, we believe as Catholic men and women, the freer we actually are. And the thing about the reality of celebrating the traditional Mass is, yes, it has curtailed, if you will, my options. And now that I have been through the cycle of the liturgical year several times now, because our, our calendar obviously, our calendar only changes with the dates, uh, the readings don't change. The readings are the same. There's no cycle of readings, uh, with few exceptions, depending on what's happening. Um, it, it, I don't feel as if I've lost anything at all. I don't mm. feel hampered. I don't feel limited. I don't feel that my experience... Because first of all, who, who am I mm. to improve on what God gave mm. to us? Mm-hmm. I'm no one. I'm his instrument. And this clearly communicates that. But in a way that doesn't, get, that doesn't diminish me, it actually elevates me in a beautiful way. I, uh, yeah, anyway. You, you're, you're alluding to it. And again, uh, Monsignor, you're a um, sacramental theologian. Theology. Theologian. Theologian, sorry. You no, you're... Right. But um, one thing that most people don't appreciate about the Church, the Catholic Church, in respect to the sacraments is, and I'm going to try and quote you here, um, we have visible signs that are interconnected to grace that are symbolic of the reality that is actually occurring. That is correct. And, and, you, you, and and I'm going to go a step further on that. You're quoting me, huh? Uh-huh. That sounds pretty good. It was good. That's nice. It's nice uh-huh. to know I got it right. I'm always <laughs> worried when I do this. I'm like, I'm, some, but I would also just to to clarify myself, if you will, this com, this communicating the reality, the 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 sign is also part of communicating it. That's the difference. So a stop sign. I would always tell people, really, we should call them, and in the Catholic, we should call them stop symbols. Because, and again, if you're from St. Louis, you would know, stop signs really are kind of an indication maybe kind of slow down. They don't actually <laughs> make you stop. You should stop. I'm not saying just be disobedient, but we are so super loaded with stop signs. If you grow up in St. Louis, you get used to kind of the rolling stop. So if it were a true sacrament, as we're describing sacraments, it would not only point to the reality, but it would be participating in the reality such that it would communicate the reality, meaning the sign would actually make you stop. What the sacraments do, the sign of water isn't just a conduit for grace. It communicates the grace so that it effectively does what the sacrament of baptism is supposed to do. You're washed pure. You're washed clean. You're grafted unto Christ. 
That's not a symbolic reality. For that's real and true. I'm getting chills just thinking about it. And the beauty of that is God uses these simple things. They're his things. He created them, so he's already imbued them with himself. He uses simple things, water, bread, wine, to bring to us these realities that would be beyond our comprehension. And because he is so solicitous of us, he loves us, he's the master teacher, he knows our capacity is limited. We're finite. I can't contemplate and grapple with the infinite. So how does the living God come to me? Through bread and wine, through a burning bush, through a voice from the sky, through the Lord incarnate. But we know for every one of those manifestations, especially our Lord himself, there were still people who rejected him because they, they couldn't comprehend it. So when we come to the sacramental life of the church, we come to the liturgy, then all the things that we're doing are part of helping us and participating in what God intends for these particular simple natural things, bread and wine, to communicate body and blood. And, and if we had uh, some dignitary coming to... Uh, visit with us here in St. Louis, uh, 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 the French president, let's say, or, or or the Holy Father or whoever it is, it would not be unusual and we wouldn't find it odd if we had a bit of pomp and circumstance, if we were formal, if we dressed up. if we're... The reality of the Mass is our Lord is becoming present to us and going to become part of us. We're going to have this extraordinarily intimate communication with the all-powerful, the almighty. The Latin Mass tends to put you in a different mindset. You know, I, I, I uh, was talking to my fellow Knights of Columbus, and I said, we ought to have a new campaign, you know, Knights on Their Knees, you know, because when we come into church now, I find so many people don't genuflect. I mean, the, the reality is we're coming into God's presence, right? In, in the uh, traditional Mass, our mind is quieted. Our hearts are opened. We know we're in a sacred space. Why? Because we act like it and we participate in it. We, by changing our actions, we are changing our attitude. So I agree 100,000% with you. And I think you can see actually where the fact that we have ceased to genuflect when we come into church. We become so casual about our approach to the Lord that it actually has impacted our faith in our Lord's real presence. So we know, statistically, the numbers are pretty high of people who identify as Catholics who don't believe in the Lord's real presence. And in one measure, you could say, well, it's poor catechesis. It may be. But, I mean, again, remember, for the first 1,500 years of the Church, there were no, there were no catechisms. There were no books. Right. No one right. went to school. Right. But they had a faith in it. I mean, people died for the the Lord's presence. Literally. Literally died, exactly. So how did they learn this? Because as you say, everything was happening ritualistically, communicated the dignity of what was being experienced. We'll be right back and tell a friend to come and join us, please. Looking for a way to teach your children about our Catholic faith? Colby Academy has the solution, offering a curriculum that is loyal to the magisterium, classical, Ignatian, flexible, and affordable. Colby can help with all your homeschooling needs. We offer a wide range of services, including live online courses for those looking for assistance teaching their students, recorded self-paced courses for those who want teacher instruction while needing the flexibility to move at their own pace, and traditional homeschool courses for maximum flexibility in home education. Our support services include advising for parents, record keeping and transcript services, a grading service, standardized testing, and guidance and college counseling. For more information, check out their website at colby.org. That's K-O-L-B-E dot org. Or give them a call. Area code 707-255-6499. That's 707-255-6499. It's Colby Academy. St. Joseph Catholic Radio is proud to announce the launch of SJEN-TV, the St. Joseph Evangelization Network. SJEN-TV is a premier online Catholic broadcasting network providing quality Catholic programming 24 hours a day, 7 days a week. We have programming such as live studio interviews, St. Joe's Java speaker presentations, current Catholic issues, and the pro-life series. We're featuring the many talented speakers out of Orange County, California, and the Archdiocese of St. Louis, Missouri. 
including Professor John Gresham, Father James Mason, Karen No Kemper, Rick Hollerick, Bill Federer, and many more. To review the program list, go to sjen.tv or on Roku, sjen.tv. All this programming is free, and we are welcoming sponsorship of new programs. Find out more at sjen.tv. <laughs> Well, we're back. This is St. Joseph Radio Presents, coming to you live from St. Louis, Missouri. I'm your host, Peter Karutz, and we are live with Monsignor Morris, and we're talking about the traditional Mass. And by the way, if you would like to, and I know I'm going to, if you'd like a copy of this program or any other, you may call us at 636-447-6000. I'll say that again more clearly, 636-447-6000, and you can get a copy of this program or any others. And let me just put a plug in for a series of, of three talks that you have, Monsignor, on the Mass. And... Um, uh, you have to take notes. It, it, it's, it's really good stuff. Look, if you've been Catholic all your life, and I have, we still have an opportunity to learn. We really do. So many people uh, in life, in their careers, stop studying when they're in eighth grade. No! I mean, I, I, I'm not a lawyer. I'm a, an accountant, but I'm I apologize. still— apologize. Yeah, well, you're forgiven. I apologize. <laughs> but I continue to learn every single day. Why shouldn't we learn about our faith? And, and if you thought you've reached the end of the Internet or you've reached the end of what you can learn about faith, remember that the topic is the infinite good, the all-powerful. I guarantee you, you don't get to the end. So please, uh, consult Roku, sjen.tv. And just flip through it. You'll find some great talks. Certainly three of them, as I can recall, uh, you did on the Mass. And it's just fantastic. And we're talking about the traditional Mass. One thing you said, Monsignor, and I'm, I'm, uh, I'm going to just touch on it for a minute. Here in the, the New Order, we have three cycles of Scripture that we run through. In the traditional Mass, we have one cycle, but we also have something unique— and that is the final gospel, which is always the same. Right. And the final gospel is the, at the end of Mass, right? Correct. So, again, the history of the development of, you know, and again, one of the things that's hard for us to understand in kind of the post conciliar, the post Vatican II reality is that a, 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 the liturgy develops organically. In truth, Rome, really oftentimes in the history of the development of liturgy, especially before the Council of Trent, was always kind of the last one to be part of any innovation. And really what Rome would do was not innovate. Rome would actually affirm innovations that had happened by virtue of various public pieties or things that had been added from the monastic tradition and said, you know what, this is good for the whole church. It seems to be, it worked in, in Spain. Let's do this for the whole church. It worked in Portugal. It worked in England, wherever. And so the last gospel grew out of a devotion to contemplate uh, so Mass, in a sense, has already ended, because the priest uh, turns back to the altar after he does the prayer of communion, says, Ite me se est, Mass is ended, it is finished, kisses the altar, turns around, he blesses the people, then he goes over and he does the last gospel, which is the prologue to the Gospel of St. John, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was made, but, which again, even as even studying theology took me a long time to understand it, and now I'm understanding it even better, because i got to pay attention to what it is I'm actually saying. And so now, having done this multiple times a day, um, multiple times on Sunday, I still sit down probably two or three times a week, and I will read through uh, a translation that I have. Uh, I have an uh, English-Latin translation of sacred scripture. I know, what, I know what it says. I mean, I can give it to you in English. I know what, the, I know what it is. But just as you read it again and see what the words and the nuances. So there is this thing called the last gospel. Why? As an act of thanksgiving. And that's the beauty, that's the beauty of the prayers at the foot of the altar at the beginning of Mass and the last gospel at the end of Mass. It actually forces everybody to do something that we may not naturally be inclined to do. So what do the prayers at the foot of the altar do? They help you kind of slow your heart right now, to help you kind of put yourself together. So if you actually are running late, and the traditional Mass, you still have a few more minutes, if you will. If you're getting in the pew and Father's still at the prayers of the foot of the altar, he's still standing at the foot of the altar, he actually has not gone up and begun Mass. He begins Mass with the introit. So you've still got some time. 
And then at the conclusion of Mass, maybe communion was harried. You know, I'm blessed with a large community that continues to grow, large families. So some of my families are 10 kids. Wow. A lot of energy there, yeah. corralling that and oh, trying yeah. to pay attention. And so maybe after I received all the communion, I wasn't able to do my Thanksgiving because my three-year-old was climbing all over me. There still is time for that. Father will go over and he'll do the last gospel. And then there was another custom of just some prayers to our Blessed Mother that developed. So again, what this does is, you know, do, do, do you have to do the prayers after low Mass? You don't have to do them. The last gospel you do, the prayers you don't have to. But it just kind of, it, it not kind of, it forces you in a good way to do something that you should be doing every time you celebrate Mass and give thanks to God. Yeah, and, and what a uh, profession of faith. Yes. Uh, what a creed. Uh, I mean, the, the, the prologue to the Gospel of John. Uh, I, I remember I was uh, in an airport, and I saw some people behind a counter, and I waved at them. And, you know, they're trying to spread the word in their own particular way. I came back from out of town, and I knew no one was home, so I stopped and talked to them for the next two and a half hours. <laughs> and That doesn't surprise me at all. <laughs> but w- what I said is, I, I said, let's just quote the prologue of the Gospel of John, and and we read it out of their scripture, and um, at the end of it, it, it says the Word uh, was with God, and the Word was a God. Mm. And obviously their, their theology didn't recognize Christ's divinity. Okay. So when, you, when we read that first uh, words of that Gospel, we have, we have seen, we've understood the Trinity, we understand the interrelationship between God the Father and the Son and the creation of the world and everything. I mean, it's it's a wonderful synopsis. What a great way to end the Mass. Correct. And uh, I'm going to quote you again. Okay. All right. You were quoting Thomas, I think. <clears throat> and um, so th- w- why is it important to have these various, I think we said 23 or maybe more different rites different ways of, of uh, celebrating Mass. Why, it, why is Mass so important? And I think you were quoting Thomas saying, um, the Eucharist is our access to the passion. Uh, how we have connection with salvation. The center, it is the center of salvation history. This is big. <laughs> this is huge. It is, and and again, it, it we're laughing at that not because it. I mean, because it seems disproportionate to say it's huge. Well, of course it is. But then you think about it. This actually, I mean, literally, we have. So Thomas and I am paraphrasing Thomas. Forgive me, the, 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 the angelic doctor. The, the Eucharist is our. It is our primary contact with the whole Paschal mystery, the Lord's incarnation, and then of course, particularly His passion, death, and glorious resurrection. All of that is experienced every time we come to Mass. So if you're praying during Holy Week and you're thinking, could I be at the foot of the cross? The answer is you are at the foot of the cross when you're at Holy Mass. Time has folded into itself. Exactly. We are not re-sacrificing Christ. We are participating in the one sacrificial act. Correct, which is not, while it happens in time and space, is not bound by time and space. I don't want to get too far afield, but this, of course, is the theology that explains Our Lady's Immaculate Conception. How can Mary have received, before she gave birth to her son, the very graces she needed to be born without the stain of original sin? Because what her son accomplishes is not limited to the future, the present, or the past. It has the ability, if you will, to go back, if you will, or to. So it, it, again, we're limited. We we can't we can't we 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 think about time travel, space travel, being out of time, as kind of a fanciful thing. God is the Alpha and the Omega. He's not bound by it. He submits to it, but it isn't bound by it. So we we uh, I, I know we whenever you're trying to describe uh, something supernatural, any analogy will will suffer a little bit. Yes, but. Monsignor, when you look at that computer screen over there, and if you want to find the creator of that computer screen and you bust it open, I guarantee you, you're not going to find the creator in there. Right. So if you want to find the creator of time and space and matter, you're not going to find it in time and space and matter. <coughs> and and with me. regard to Our Lady, uh, it hit me uh, when I, I was actually talking to a friend who was having difficulty with that concept of the Immaculate Conception. And... Uh, he was a Protestant, mm. and actually a, a guy who works for me, and he came by and he says, I just talked to Maricela, and she said that you saved her life. I said, what? 
10 years ago, I was in Santiago, Chile, and we were working on the earthquakes. And we were about to cross a street. It's the main thoroughfare in the capital. It's Unso de Septembre. It's a, it's a huge, it's, it has to do with the date of the revolution. <clears throat> and we were talking intensely, and she stepped out into traffic, not paying attention. And in, in, in Santiago, Chile, you walk into traffic, you die. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I literally grabbed her bodily and dragged her back up onto the You can save someone before they get killed. Correct. Our Lord operates outside of time. Right. You know, he created the whole universe. What are we saying? Even the concept of saying, oh, God can't do that. I mean, it's contrary to, to, to logic. God can do anything he wants, and Correct. why wouldn't he do that to his own mother? Anyway, we're getting far afield. That's there, right? right, we are. But uh, um, I want to go back, though, just to make sure, because I think your point about was a valid one about the different rights. Because it is this, con- it is the primary contact. The fact that there are these different ways of experiencing it should not be seen as competition, but is opening up to us ways to do that. So, if you grew up in the Eastern tradition, you grew up a Ruthenian or a Melkite or uh, a Russian Orthodox or a Byzantine Orthodox uh, or a Maronite, your 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 experience is going to be different from mine. As a, I'm a Rome, I'm very much a Roman. Mm-hmm. I'm a Roman Catholic. Mm-hmm. I think like a Roman. My mind is, you know, Aristotle and distinctions and all that good stuff. Um, if you're an Easterner, there's going to be a little bit, in a sense, more free-flowing spirituality in a good way than there would be for us. Those aren't ways of conflict, though. No. Because I can also, because I can go there and worship with my brothers and sisters and benefit from their insights as to how they worship, and so they from us as well, because we're dealing with something that is ineffable, Beyond us and yet still accessible to yeah. us. Pope uh, John Paul said it's uh, the East and the West is like breathing with both lungs. Yes. It isn't co- in conflict. It's, it's congruency. So before we go any further, uh, Monsignor, tell me a little bit. I, I want to be inviting. I want you to, to maybe we put out an invitation for sure. people to come and experience this thing that we're yes. all going crazy over. And, and tell me a little bit about the missile. Tell, uh, invite, you know, when are you going to have, when do you have mass? And uh, how, how will people follow along if this is their first time? So the Oratory of St. Gregory and Augustine is an apostle to the Archdiocese of St. Louis, founded by Cardinal Burke uh, around 2006 or so, 2006, 2007, in that area. Maybe probably a little bit before. I, I'd have to go back and check my history again. Uh, we are located, if you're in the Archdiocese or near the Archdiocese or passing through, we're at the Church of St. Luke the Evangelist. That's where we're actually housed. So we sh- basically there are two parishes under one roof. It's a very unique situation. Our daily, our Sunday Mass schedule is 6.45 a.m., uh, 8 a.m., and 11.30 a.m. One of those would be a low Mass and one would be a high Mass? That is, two of those are low Masses. The 6.45 and 8 are low Masses, and the 11.30 is high Mass. What's the difference? The primary difference is at the low Mass, everything is recited. Uh, if there's any music at all... There is no music on the part of the faithful or the priest. It's only accompaniment from the organ, maybe in the parts where there's more silence. At the, low, at the high mass, there is, everything is chanted. Actually, it's the opposite. There is no recitation of anything except for the readings in the vernacular, which happen after the proclamation of the gospel in Latin. The missile. The missile, and I may have to come back, the missile can be a complicated thing. But in answer to your question, the more important one, I think, is how do people who come who aren't used to this prepare? So there are resources both on our website, but there, there really are a beautiful plethora of resources online. So if you were to type in Extraordinary Form or Latin Mass supplements or Latin Mass, you're going to find something that's going to either do a side-by-side comparison or just give you the order of it, maybe the Latin and the English you can follow along. But in my pews, I have available for the faithful something called the Edmund Campion Missal put out by Corpus Christi Watershed, a group devoted to chant and other great resources out of Texas. Uh, I, think I, bought, I think I bought the last round of these. There are 300 of them in my church. Uh, those are there for the faithful. And my people are very, very welcoming in that if they see somebody that looks like they don't know what they're doing, <laughs> they are going to help you. And so if you come and you're not sure what to do, Ask somebody there, and they will be more than happy to help you. And what will you find in that missile? You'll find the order of Mass, which will help you follow along with what's happening at the Mass. Just in Latin. 
in Latin and English. So you know, thank you, in Latin and English. You teed me up for that one. Thank you. And uh, you will also find the readings, uh, both in Latin and English, again, to help you follow along with what's going on. And as it is in the New Mass, so it is in the Old Mass. There are parts that never change. So the Mass begins with the sign of the cross, you have the introductory rites, you have the Kyrie, and on Sunday you have the Gloria, then you have the Liturgy of the Word, where you have your first reading, you have the, for us, we have just one reading from the Epistle, and then we have what we call the Gradual, which is akin to the Responsorial Psalm, we have the Alleluia, we have the Gospel, we have the Homily, we have the Creed. Those are all things that happen in the same order as they do in the ordinary form. And and we will recognize, I've gone to Mass in, in, in Spanish, Portuguese, uh, Italian, all kinds of different languages, so you can f- be f- very familiar with the order of the Mass. And I think, Monsignor, you were saying that it's all in Latin, but maybe the homily is in English? Homily is definitely in English. There okay. was never, uh, I shouldn't say there was never a tradition of preaching in Latin. Actually, there was at times uh, more of an exercise of one's linguistic abilities than it was any requirement. But yes, they are in English, and then what has become customary, and now is encouraged uh, by the current modo proprio, uh, traditionis custodes, is that the readings be in the vernacular at some point. So the custom at the Oratory of Saints Gregory and Augustine is after I have proclaimed the gospel, I make my, which I do at the altar, I make my way to the ambo, I'll ask everyone to be seated, I'll do the first reading, then I'll ask everyone to rise to the gospel, and then I'll preach. Perfect. This is St. Joseph Radio Presents, coming to you live from St. Louis, Missouri, um, the Rome of the West. Yes. How about that? There's a good story behind that. (laughs) And uh, I am your host, Peter Karutz. I'm here with Monsignor Morris. We're talking about the traditional Mass. If you would like a copy of this program or any other program, please call us at 636-447-6000, 636-447-6000. And and frankly, share this program with your friends, please. You know, this is a place where we try and... uh, and, and continue learning, right, and growing in the faith. Uh, so please think about that. One other thing we might think about, if you want to encourage a, a, a man uh, to do, and that is the Catholic Men for Christ Conference. Yes. That's coming up on April the 12th. February have, the 12th. I'm sorry. Thank you very much. You're it's welcome. February the 12th. <laughs> You'd miss it if you listen to me. February the 12th. Google it. Uh, just Catholic Men for Christ, you'll find it. Uh, I The um, Father, is it Bozeman, I think? I think his name is. And, uh, he's uh, he's going to be speaking. He's, uh, as I recall, the new rector of the seminary. Oh, Father uh, Hazing. Hazing. Father Paul Hazing. Pa- Paul, Paul Hazing. He's going to be... Yes, he is speaking. He's the new rector of the seminary. Yeah, yes. yeah. I think I just Just recently that. appointed last week. And then we have uh, uh, Steve Algeyer. He has been an uh, integral part of um, Life Teen International for years, and he's right here in St. Louis. Let me tell you, if one of the greatest heartaches, I think, that uh, we older folks have is our children walking away from the faith. This is a man who's done a great deal of good. There's three million young people going to the Life Teen Mass every Sunday. You know, just for him, come and see it. And then, and then of course, we have the author of The Great Adventure, um, whose name is escaping me right now. Um, but he, he has, a, a, a Father Schmitz has a podcast right now that uh, allows you to go through the Bible in one year, right? Anyway, so come and see us. Go, go to catholicmenforchrist.com. Or I'm sorry, go to catholicmenforchrist on Google. You'll find it, register. And uh, if you're a woman, invite a good man. If you don't know a good man, invite a bad man, because we are all pretty bad. We need to get better. Uh, I, I think men have to really be a bigger part of the church. And, and then I think as the soon women... as you invite a man, they will come. I'm sorry, Peter. Excuse no, me. Go ahead. I think the women's conference is a month later. It is. It's March. It may be March the 12th. It, Does that sound right? It, I don't it's have my something account. like that. I yes. don't have it with yeah, me. I either. apologize. So yeah, we'll and we'll certainly <clears throat> promote that too. You know, one of the things we used to do, and I, I hope we can do it this time, is uh, at the Catholic Men for Christ, we have an opportunity for men to buy the tickets for the women for the conference that's coming up. Yes. Uh, you know that it's working if that's going on. Right. I was going to say, too, one of the things that I have grown to appreciate and to, to encourage people to come is uh, the number of young people that we have actually coming to Mass who are discovering the old Mass. At the oratory. At the oratory. I am probably now getting the point of being at the older end of my congregation. Uh, my median age is probably, excuse me, anywhere between 35 and 40 
because I have so many young people coming. And people will ask me the question, why is it that you, ha- why do I think I have so many young people coming? Again, I think in much the same way that Life Teen speaks to our young people, this is providing for them. They're looking for something. They're looking for something transcendent. They want something that's going to call themselves out of themselves. And the, and again, it's it's uh, I don't I don't do a lot of um, I don't do a lot of proselytizing, if you will, or kind of advertising. I, mean, I do the normal advertising. We have a website and all that good stuff, and we do in the review, which is the uh, newspaper for the Archdiocese of St. Louis. But in terms of kind of me just kind of hawking it out there, I, you know, I'm like I'm just gonna let people come, uh, and and I find that it 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 works much better if I just kind of stay out of the picture in that regard, and and with with my young people especially. A lot of young people from St. Louis, from Washu, in the neighborhood, and it's just amazing. And again, come they, when they come, my exhortation is always keep coming back maybe two or three times, and it will be easier and easier and more sensible, if you will, the more frequently you return. Psychologists will tell us that we react more to what we see than what we hear to some extent. Uh, there's an old study of uh, groups of people who were presented to talk by somebody, and they were asked whether they found him to be intelligent or not. And they did the same thing, but they didn't have the sound on. And ironically, they both came to the same conclusion without even hearing a single word. Mm-hmm. Now, uh, again, I'm just saying that because most people won't understand every word of the Latin. I Correct. remember when I was a child, and Obviously, th- this is the Latin Mass going on because I was about four years old. And I remember being in Mass and I saw all of the statues mm-hmm. covered. Mm-hmm. And uh, my mom had, had really gave me a great uh, sense of uh, who Christ was in a personal fashion. You know, who was Christ? He was baby Jesus. Yeah, he was my friend. He was the one who took care of me. And, and uh, <laughs> apparently you're not supposed to talk during Latin Mass either. But <laughs> I, I remember talking to the ladies behind me, right? <clears throat> So uh, any of you parents who are still struggling with children who, who won't pay attention at Mass, it, it, you know, it happens. But we were, uh, I was seeing what was going on. I was not understanding what was going on, but I, I, I could sense it to some extent. And I turned to the lady behind me and I said, what, what, what's going on? Why, why, did, why is everything covered? And the lady said, ah, that's because they killed Jesus. <laughs> and as a four-year-old, th- wow. Yeah, and so you thought my parents had a p- hard time with me uh, uh, before then. And another lady came up to me and says, well, I'll give you this little holy card of baby Jesus and you'll stop crying. We might not understand the words, even children, but they understand, they feel what's going on. Yeah, It is, uh, as you said before, Monsignor, the signs are... Uh, are imp- imp- um, You'll say it better. Implicit of the of the reality. Mm-hmm. It's not, it's not only representing it; it is the. It's reality. communicating. It's it, communicating. Correct. And then the our reality. symbols reinforce that. So you know, veiling during the season of Passion Tide, those two weeks before we get to the Sacred Triduum, it it, it what does it do for us? It covers us. And I I, I remember uh, last year because uh, we dramatically covered the um, the statuary behind our altar. We have a beautiful Rarados with the images of the apostles and the evangelists, and I, I obviously I contemplate that and see that every Sunday. And so for two weeks, basically, to have that not in my sight, when it was when the curtains were finally pulled down during the Gloria, I, I started crying. I was like, I, I, I you know, like it was only two weeks. It wasn't like it was like a lifetime. It was only two weeks. Dude, buck up, you know. And I've got statues in my room, so it's not as if I'm not going to see them. But again, something was something something that I took for granted not only was taken away from me, but it had hidden some of the the beauty and the majesty and the grandeur of what was being celebrated. So uh, there, there are so many things that beautifully coalesce, and you had said it earlier, that in, in some ways better assists us in entering into the sacred mysteries we're celebrating. In the few minutes we have left, I, it would be crazy if we didn't talk about the reception of communion. Yes. Um, in, in the... Um, in our common way of receiving, boy, I hate to say common, in, in the Current, opportunities that we yeah. have available to us to receive communion uh, at any Mass, of course, we can receive it in the hand, we can receive it on the tongue, we can receive it on the knees. But in the traditional Mass, we do it in one way. That's correct. You are kneeling at the communion rail, which is called such because it's an extension of the altar. So, ah. yes, it was always oh, considered an I extension. Didn't know that. Yes. So this, this, and I don't want to get to, I know we only have a few more minutes left. Real quickly, there was a time in life of the church where you could not as easily enter the sanctuary as we do now. It was literally the Holy of Holies. 
But how did the faithful, how did the faithful approach the altar? Well, if they can't actually get to it, the communion rail became an extension of the altar, and that was the place you went to receive. So not just Holy Communion, that's the place you go to receive ashes. That's where we will uh, distribute um, the candles for candlemas. So you receive Holy Communion kneeling and on the tongue. Those are the only two ways to do it. And you are literally bringing Christ to I'm the people. I'm literally bringing Christ to the people. Thank you so much for joining us, Monsignor, and thank you for joining us. Come back and join us next week and tell a friend, please. listening to St. Joseph Radio presents from the Rome of the West, St. Louis, Missouri. If you would like to join us in our evangelization efforts, you can order a copy of today's broadcast or any of our past programs by visiting us on our website, stjosephradio.net. That's S-A-I-N-T, josephradio.net. Or call us, 636-447-6000. It's all at your fingertips to help us evangelize the world, bringing the good news of Christ to everyone you meet and change one soul at a time. Thank you for your prayers and support. Until next time, may God bless you and your family. This has been a presentation of St. Joseph Radio Presents.